2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 5. We're going to start. Uh, I do apologize if the message is a little bit... You can stand, yeah. Uh, I do apologize if the message is a little bit scattered. Um, I, I, I mean, I know I want it, what I want to say, but I'm not positive I got it all down right. I've got so many things that, I, that have been kind of going through my head as I've been looking through 2 Corinthians 8 and... and uh, uh, chapters 8 and chapter 9, uh, so many things that actually uh, today, even uh, reading in my personal devotions this morning, um, in uh, 2 Corinthians in chapter um, uh, number uh, 10, I think it was this morning, my mind just went blank on that. Even there I thought, ah, here's more I can say, but uh, so I'll try to stay off of those things today. And just to this passage, the Bible says, moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God. Let me just share, stop for half a second. The, we do you to wit. Now, uh, have you ever heard anyone use that phrase in common language today? No, that would be called an, uh, 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 that, that would be an ancient phrase. I think this is interesting. As I was doing my studying for this, I, one of the commentaries that I read is a guy by the name of John Gill. He was a Baptist pastor in the, uh, in the, the 1700s. In his commentary, he says, Do you to wit is an ancient phrase not commonly used today. It was Old English, even in the Old English times. And so anyway, just like that, that, that was interesting. Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, how that in a great trial of affliction, uh, the abundance of their joy, uh, uh, I'm sorry, let me start, how that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. For to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power, they were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty that we would... Uh, receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints and this they did not as we hope but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God I, I got saved when I was uh, at 18 years old watching a television program um, because I did, I'd only gone to church a handful of times my whole life probably less than five times my my entire life prior to that I got saved watching a television program but when I did go to church at the age of 21 the first time I really went to church more than just you know those handful of times as a kid first time I went to church with the intent of going to church and with the intent of worshiping the Lord and and living for God it was at the age of 21 it was a and it was an independent fundamental Baptist church and I am very thankful that God got me started connected with an independent fundamental Baptist church. I'm very, very grateful for the heritage and for the, the, the roots that God has given me in, in the Baptist faith. And it's because I believe that the, that the roots are so biblical and, and, and so right fundamentally and, and, and doctrinally and, um, and even historically. I believe the Baptist church is the, is the church that when Jesus said, I'll build my church, uh, build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I, I believe without question that he's talking about what is today the Baptist Church. I'm very, very thankful for the heritage that I have. And I'm very, very thankful that not only the, when, I, when I started attending church that God led me not only so that I would go to church. By the way, that church was, it was only a week old. The first Sunday that I went there was its second Sunday of, a, of, of, uh, of existence. And ten people meeting in the pastor's living room is all it was uh, in this little church I started. But I'm very thankful that when we got started that, that, that the pastor of that church that was just starting there was at the time closely connected with an organization called the Baptist Bible Fellowship. Which, by the way, our church, this church, is historically closely connected to, and I'm very thankful for that, and, and uh, for the, the heritage and the roots that we receive. One of the things that happened when I first started attending church, and I, don't, I can't remember, it wasn't, you know, the first month, or, or, you know, it was probably several months later, or, you know, after I started going to church, that I received a, a copy of a little booklet that was produced by the Baptist Bible Fellowship, just called the Articles of Faith. It was 20 things, 20 doctrines that the, that the, that the pastors who fellowshiped with the Baptist Bible Bible Fellowship agreed upon. These are 20 doctrinal positions that the, the pastors involved in the BBF agreed were biblical and solid. And while they may not have agreed on everything else, they did agree on these 20 things and these 20 positions. The 20th of those doctrines in the Articles of Faith is called the grace of giving. That was the, and I've always thought that was an interesting title. It's talking about tithing. 
they title this subject tithing, the grace of giving. I always just thought that was an interesting uh, a title for it. I don't know uh, who first came up with the idea of using the grace of giving. I don't know uh, where it came up. In fact, I spent a little bit of time, I, I, uh, admittedly, I wasn't in a position um, physically this week to spend a lot of, do a lot of research on, on, on this. But, uh, so I did spend some time trying to find the very first time someone may have used that phrase and the grace of giving and where it might have come up with the very first time. I looked to see the, the, the earliest um, uh, Baptist uh, doctrinal statement that I know of, that, that, uh, that I know of, was written in about 1640 and uh, uh, so it's not there and uh, so I don't know where the very first I couldn't find the very first time it was used I don't know who the first person who ever called the subject of tithing and and giving where whoever called it the grace of giving I'm not sure whoever came, uh, started that but I, I I don't know that I ever fully appreciated how um, thoughtful and accurate that phrase was that phrase is, I should say, until just recently. By the way, um, while I think the Baptist Bible Fellowship has now slipped doctrinally, it's no longer an organization that we align with. It's not a fellowship that we participate in uh, anymore. Uh, they've gone into some uh, more worldly types of things and uh, that, that we can't agree with anymore. But uh, I do those, believe those early, um, the founders of the Baptist Bible Fellowship, those early preachers, some of them were men of extraordinary spiritual gifts. Extraordinary ability, extraordinary spiritual gifts. For instance, um, when the fellowship started back in the 1950s, they started in a Texas hotel. Uh, and, um, and, and among the men that, that met there to begin this brand new fellowship was a, was a young man by the name of J.O. Combs. He was still in his 20s at the time. He's a, so that means he's a very young preacher and still in his 20s. And, and he's the one who gave the fellowship the name Baptist Bible Fellowship. He says, well, we're Baptists. We're going to start a fellowship. It ought to be about the Bible. Let's call it the Baptist Bible Fellowship. <laughs> and that's, I think that's just profound. And it wasn't some oldster that came up with it. It was a young kid who came up with that. The very first missions director of the Baptist Bible Fellowship was a man by the name of Fred Donaldson. And uh, I mean, in my mind, uh, Fred Donaldson and a couple of other guys that lived at the same time, a guy by the name of John Birch and another one. What was he? Oh, I just lost his name. Um, uh, the boys, Bo and Caleb, the very last picture of this preacher uh, ever taken of this preacher was with... Uh, uh, was was Bo and Caleb as kids, and I can't remember his name, but um, Fred Donaldson and uh, John Birch and this other fellow, which I can't remember his name. Yeah, uh, Wells, Oscar Wells, and uh, um, Oscar Wells, John Birch, and uh, Fred Donaldson were all missionaries to China during um, the time when the Japanese invaded, and um, and Wells and and Donaldson were taken prisoners of war. John Birch was out in, uh, in the field um, preaching and he actually didn't get caught and he actually went to work for um, the um, Fighting Tigers for a while as a spy for the Fighting Tigers and all those kind of things. Pretty interesting character. But Fred and Effie Donaldson spent two years on, on, as prisoners of war for the, of the Japanese. They were missionaries in China, but they're captured in China and spent two years as missionary as prisoners of war. So they spent 16 years as missionaries there, two years as prisoners of war. When they came back to the United States of America, they were involved in um, the founding. They were uh, involved in the founding of the Baptist Bible Fellowship. And um, Fred Donaldson, the first missions director, said, here, here, he said something like this. He said, let missions, I think two of the two very famous quotes of his, let missions be the strong right arm of this fellowship. We're going to start a fellowship. Let missions be the strong right arm of the fellowship. And you know what? I believe missions ought to be the strong right arm of every church. I've believed that since, uh, since I've been in the ministry. One of the first things I felt like I needed to do as a missionary, or as a missionary, as a church planter, when I started in the ministry, one of the first things that I felt like I needed to do was take on a missionary. Our church needed to support a missionary because I don't believe a church is a church unless it's supporting missions. So we just, I mean, took on missions, right? For, let, let missions be the strong right arm of the fellowship. And then he made this statement. He said, uh, at least I'm, I, I, I believe it was him that made this statement, that the light that shines farthest shines brightest at home. Missions statements that are very uh, profound, I believe. The faith promise plan 
we're talking about you know, how we get and come to the place where we've got a church that uses faith promise as in our as our means of supporting missions. The faith promise plan for supporting missions wasn't really, at least as far as I understand, it didn't really it wasn't invented by the Baptist Bible Fellowship. In fact, I I don't know that you can call anything that's biblical invented by a man. Um, I try to think of a better word. Was it discovered? It certainly wasn't. It, it certainly isn't that um, faith promise like we do faith promise today has always been the way missions has been supported. It's not. Uh, and uh, uh, but I do know that uh, that it was a guy by the name of Clifford Clark who introduced it to the pastors of the Baptist Bible Fellowship. Clifford Clark, which, by the way, I think is an interesting connection. Clifford Clark was led to the Lord by Dr. Dennis Brown, who used to pastor Yakima Baptist, uh, Yakima Bible Baptist Church. His son, Dave, who's a good friend of mine, pastors it now. Uh, Dr. Brown led Clifford Clark to the Lord. Clifford Clark later went to Tulsa, uh, Oklahoma, started the Tulsa Baptist Temple. And uh, it was there that Clifford Clark began using uh, faith promise as a, as a plan for some, uh, some raising money to support missionaries. Some other pastors saw what he was doing, came and saw what he was doing and said, man, what is this thing? And, uh, and he's the one who introduced it into the fellowship churches and, and, uh, and made it to what it is in churches today. And, and, um, and you know, so it's all men kind of things, but these are great men. And, and, and so one of the things that comes to my mind, I mentioned this a little bit in the Sunday school lesson, is um, plans and programs scare me. Uh, you know, if a man invents something, a man comes up with an idea, and he comes up with this plan or this program, and we say, oh, wow, that looks like a great way to build a church, or oh, wow, that looks like a great way to, you know, to increase this, or oh, wow, that looks like a great way to, 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 to do this ministry in the church, it can oftentimes come back to bite you. Uh, you introduce something in church. Uh, we've got a, a program. We, we have uh, in our church, we use uh, uh, hope as addictions ministry. And previous to hope, um, I learned about another ministry that was very similar to this. And, and, and that ministry, uh, Reformers, Re Reformers Unanimous, uh, it, uh, Reformers Unanimous wanted you to introduce the, uh, uh, their program into the church. And then they wanted to take over the church. So very often programs do that. They, the program becomes uh, more important than the local church that it, that it comes to. So it wants in the church, it needs the church as a place to survive. But then when it comes in the church, it wants to eat the church and consume the church and, and take over the church. And those kinds of things happen. And so I'm always concerned about programs and plans and that men came up, I come up with. I'm looking for something from the Word of God. And, and I'll just tell you this, the longer I've been involved, the more that I study, the more that I look into the Word of God, the more I am convinced that faith promise is a, is a, uh, is a biblical plan for supporting missionaries. And while uh, it may not have been what was used, uh, you know, 1,500 years ago, I do believe it's what God's Word instructs us to do in the, in the area of supporting missions, missions and sending missionaries around the world. Now, um, um, and, and when I look in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and chapter 9, I see the faith promise, promise plan of missions um, explained and taught and instructed very, very clearly. There are obviously some differences between how things were done back in Paul's day, uh, 2,000 years ago and today. So no doubt there's some differences. For instance, um, in, in what we've got here in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, we've got a missionary, the Apostle Paul who's raising money to support a poor church. And today what we do is we have churches who are raising some money to support missionaries. So there's some differences. There are some differences. There were some extenuating circumstances, though, that were in going, go, taking place in those days. They are, it is a missionary who's interested in supporting the, a church that is, uh, that is impoverished at the time, but it's an extent, it is a special circumstance. That church happens to be the very first church that was ever established, the church that the Lord started that was in Jerusalem, and it is suffering very badly. I mean, this is the roots of everything of the faith, and Every Christian owed their very faith to the church in Jerusalem, and Paul had great love for that church and had and longed to see that church survive and be blessed. He wanted to see it blessed, and so that's why he's doing that. And, and so there's some differences between there and now, but the pattern for faith promise giving is clearly found in 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9. For instance, um, have you ever wondered why we make faith promises for a year? Why is it that we have to do this every year? <laughs> 
Why can't we just, you know, every like maybe 10 years and we just come up and up, all right, we're going to plan a faith promise year or we're going to spend a whole year talking about missionaries and then once we're done, we won't have to do it again. You know, you'll have, you know, we'll, you'll spend a year, we'll talk about missions, we'll get it done, you'll never have to hear about missions again. Why in the world would we do this every year? Well, it's because in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9, you find that he's talking about planning things a year in advance. Or a year ahead. So uh, look at verse uh, chapter 8 and verse 10. And herein I give my advice, for this is expedient for you, who have begun before not only to do, but also to be forward a year ago. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 2, For I know the forwardness of your mind, for which I boast of you to them of Macedonia, and that Achaia was ready a year ago, and your zeal hath provoked very many. We're planning a year. We are preparing a year in advance. It's what we're doing is we're going to make a promise in March 27th. We're going to make a promise that is for a year that lasts for a year. We are doing it to encourage others to do the very same thing. And we're giving so missionaries won't be, want to, won't be in want. All of those things are instructed in chapters 8 and 9 of, first, of 2 Corinthians. And so uh, we're just, we're following the pattern that is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9. And then notice that Paul references in um, chapter 8 and verse 1 again, he references the um, grace of God that is bestowed upon the churches of Macedonia. Did you notice he didn't say the grace of God that is bestowed upon the Christians of Macedonia? He said, I want you to know about what God is doing in the churches of Macedonia. Listen, Christianity is a church thing. Missions is a church thing. It's not one where you and I as individuals, we get to say, well, I make this amount of money and it's my money and I can do as I please with my money and I please to give it to this guy and 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 this guy. And this guy. That isn't God's plan at all. God's plan is that missionaries are supported through the gifts and, and ministries are supported through gifts that are given in and through local churches. He says this is a grace that God gives to the churches. Not to the individuals, and God works as individuals in the churches, but he gives, it's a grace that God gives to the churches as a whole. So our giving to the cause of Christ ought to be done in and through our local church. Now, I'm going to go back. I start out with this phrase, the grace of giving. I wanted to give you a couple of reasons why I'm so impressed with the fact that the Baptist Bible Fellowship, men who, who I believe were great, great men of God, chose when they're writing their doctrinal statement, these are the things we believe these are the things we're not going to bend on. These are the things we'll fellowship around them and we won't fellowship with people who won't accept them. And when they're writing this statement, they're saying, these are the, these are the things that matter to us. When they came to the subject of giving, they said, it's the grace of giving. And it's a phrase, it's a term they're, they're, they're finding in the book of 2 Corinthians and chapter 8. Where grace is found seven times in these two chapters. Five of them are found in, in chapter 5. And I'm just going to use the, the five times, chapter 5, five of them are found in chapter 8. I'm going to use the five times that they're found in chapter 8 to get my points today. And we're just going to go through this today and see what we can learn about giving from 2 Corinthians chapter 8, grace and giving uh, from 2 Corinthians chapter 8. First of all, I'm going to call point number one, I'm just going to call it grace and poverty. Look at verses 1 through 5 again with me. I want to read all five verses one more time to you. And I just want you to kind of, uh, uh, so we're looking at the word grace. And, we're, and, and, and grace means a gift here. He's talking about them giving. But I want you to see the connection that it's found in. Moreover, brethren. We do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches in, of Macedonia, how that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. For to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power, they were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering of the saints to the saints. And this they did not as we hoped, but first gave of their own selves to the Lord and us unto unto us and unto us by the will of God. What a powerful passage. You know, we often think about, uh, we think about the idea of grace. When, boy, God's been gracious to me. Isn't that something that we would say? God is, boy, God's grace. Thank, thank God for his grace in my life. And, and what we usually mean when we, th when we talk about the idea of the grace of God, most of the time we're thinking that's when God gives me a gift. Uh, that's when God does something, a lot of times the definition of grace we use, God's riches at Christ's expense. 
That's when God gives something to me. God makes something easy for me. God opens a door for me. God um, uh, pours me out a blessing. Grace is when God does something that is a benefit to me. God's grace in saving me. God's grace in providing for my family. God's grace in empowering me for some ministry. Something like that. We're using it in the sense of it's something that I'm receiving. Grace is when I receive something. Well, the grace of God that Paul wants us to learn about here is not a grace that, 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 that is a, a, a gift that we receive. It is a grace that is a gift that we give. And this grace, he said, God, what's happening here is God gave the churches of Macedonia grace to give liberally. But notice that it was a grace to give liberally in a time of great affliction. And a grace to give liberally in a time of deep poverty. It wasn't that God gave them a whole lot so that they could give a whole lot. It's not what happened. It's not that God um, um, changed the economy in their area so now uh, they could afford to do more than they could do last year. It's not like all of a sudden God uh, did something, you know, discovered um, oil wells in the backyard of the church. I heard this years ago. CLA told a story about a church down in Texas that had called them up. And it was a small church and, and uh, you know, 50 members in a small church in a little Texas town. And, you know, and these handful of faithful, 50 faithful people in the church had gone, been there for years and years and years. And they'd gone through the hard times. They'd gone through the good times. And they just stayed together as a church and lived for God. And, and uh, and, and, and just, you know, just t together with God like that. And, and, uh, and then one day um, someone came out and discovered oil in the backyard of the church and, and you know, gave him, I don't remember, um, you know, how much money it was. It was, um, let's just, I'm going to say, I don't remember. Let's say it was, uh, how do I, I can't right now. My mind isn't well, working well enough. So, so how much was 50 times, 50 times, a, uh, uh, so that 50 times $100,000 each. How much ever that's going to be. So they call up and the pastor says, you know what, I, I mean, they're going to pay us. We're going to, we're going to have enough money. We're going to go and build a brand new building. They're going to move out. They're buying the property and it's going to be, you know, X number of dollars. And it's going to give us enough money that we're going to be able to move over. We're going to buy this piece of property over here. We're going to build a brand new facility. It's going to be top, state of line, top of, top of line kind of stuff. We're going to build that. We're going to have, and how much money is that? 50 times. How much is it? Five, what's that? Five million, okay, and it's, we're going to have five million dollars left over. And he calls CLA, the pastor called, do you think it would be inappropriate for me to give $100,000 each to the members? Brother Gibbs said, well, uh, um, can I join your church? That's <laughs> <laughs> what he said, he said. <laughs> But he said, no, you can't do that. I mean, it's illegal to do that kind of stuff, money laundering, all that kind of stuff. You can't do that. And, uh, uh, you know, but uh, uh, if someone said, well, you know what, I'll be able to give extra money this year to missions because God was gracious and gave me uh, an oil well in the backyard of the church. So now we're going to be able to give more to missions this year. That, a lot of times we think that that's what grace is, but that's not what God did to the churches in Macedonia. They were still impoverished and they were still afflicted. They were still being persecuted. And yet God still moved upon them to give liberally. In our terms, um, you got no raise, you got no promotion, your car got broke down, and when faith promise came up, you gave more anyway. And Paul says, well, that's the grace of God. When someone's circumstances don't improve, but the gift they give does, there's only one thing that can explain that. That's the grace of God. It's not the grace of God that, wow, look what God did. He made it so that there was so much more, so that they could give so much more. Paul said the grace of God is 
They had so, and I'm going to, this may be an extreme. They had no more than last year. I was going to say so much less, but they gave so much more. I don't know that they had so much less, but I know they don't have it any better than they had. And yet look what they're giving. They're giving liberally in the case, in, in their, in their situation. The, the churches of Macedonia experienced no relief as so far as we can see from the troubles that they were going through. And yet God moved upon them to, to give liberally. And, and Paul says, not only did they just give liberally, he says, but, uh, uh, they gave not, lot, not like what we hoped for them to give, but they went beyond what we uh, could possibly have expected them to give, and that's called grace. Grace and poverty. Uh, this year, you know, some people, what they'll do when it comes to faith promise, they'll say, well, if God will give me a raise, I'll give him, I promise to give a part of that raise. Some people think that's what missions is, what faith promise is, is, is that what I'm going to do this year is I'm going to say, God, if you'll give me $50 a week more than I'm making now, I'll give that $50 to you. But that's not what faith promise is. Faith promise is saying, God, I just believe missions is important. And I'm going to give this much more this year. And I'm going to trust you to take care of me. However you do it. That's what it would be. So there's grace and poverty, first of all. The second thing I notice in this passage I'm going to talk about is grace and leadership. Uh, look at verses five, 5 and 6 with me. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 5 and 6. And this they did, not as we hoped. I need to use 5 to help me to introduce number 6. And this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God, insomuch that we desired Titus, that as he had begun, so he would also finish in you the, great, the same grace also. So he said, now, number one, we've got the grace of God. I want you to know, you church at Corinth, I want you to know about what's going on in the churches of Macedonia, how that they are impoverished and they're persecuted. And yet, even though they're impoverished and persecuted, God gave them the grace to give way beyond you would have ever expected, we could have ever hoped or expected from them. And then he says, so what I did is I sent Titus so he could tell you about it and you could give more. So that you can practice the same grace. <clears throat> now, here's the question that comes to my mind when I think about that. <clears throat> when, <clears throat> all right, so God was gracious to the churches in Macedonia and they gave beyond what could be expected. I can, I can, I can accept, okay, that's of God. As soon as Paul, though, says this is what they did, I want you to do the same. If you do the same, or is it still the grace of God? Or is it the mo manipulation of a man? Is God still in it? If you hear about another ministry, about the grace of God working in another place, and, you, and that inspires you somehow to uh, imitate it, is your imitation the grace of God still? <laughs> And I'm going to suggest that at least in this case, it is. So uh, I see three sources of leadership in this passage. Number one, there's the leadership of the churches of Macedonia. Um, Paul, hears what, Paul sees and hears what the churches of Macedonia have done about this gift. And it, and it touches the heart of the Apostle Paul. It stirs his heart. He sees how this could only have been accomplished by the grace of God. This isn't, this isn't something a man can do. This isn't, this isn't somebody, I mean, it's not like they worked it out on a budget. It's not, you know, it's nothing like this. This is something God did in their hearts. It's something that God worked upon in their lives, and it stirs up the Apostle Paul. It stirs him up so much that he'd like to see some others get stirred up like he stirred up. And so he then sends, uh, there's, so now we're going to have, there's the leadership of the Macedonia that stirs up the Apostle Paul, and now Paul. Paul is stirred up in his heart, and now he's going to experience some leadership. And he, in his mind, I think I can see two things that come to his head. Number one is Titus, and number two is Corinth, the church of Corinth. He wants to see the grace there. So he sends, so that now you've got the leadership of Paul. He's going to see if he can't um, spread this grace, um, if he can't, um, um, what do you call it when... Um, when someone who is, uh, it's a con when, you know, contagious, but um, there's a term for a person who's a carrier. I'll just call him a carrier. He's a, he wants to see if he can be a carrier of that grace. And so what he does is he gives it to Titus. 
and sends him to Corinth to give it to them. And so there's the leadership of the churches of Macedonia upon Paul. Then there's the leadership of Paul upon Titus and then also and because of his letter to the church in, in Corinth too. And then there's the leadership of, the, of, of Titus. And the point of all this is this, is that it is completely appropriate, completely scriptural, and completely, completely proper for a pastor to desire his congregation to give graciously and more than he could expect. So every year I kind of try to come up with something that um, kind of becomes my own personal motivation, my own personal, what I'm working with with missions every year. It's this personal thing for me that I'm working on with missions. And this year, here's what it is. Um, I'm just wanting God to do more than I can imagine <laughs> in what you give. I'm going to give too, and I'm going to try to be a part of that. And, uh, but what I'd like to have happen this year, I'm just going to, I'm going, to, I'm going to be asking God, when this year is over, I want to be able to say, God, wow, I'd have never thought. I'd have never thought. I'd have never dreamed. That's where the Apostle Paul was. He says, uh, boy, I want to tell you about the churches of Macedonia. They gave more than I could have hoped or expected. So, uh, you know what? I want you to give more than I hoped or expected. <laughs> now, if you're asking for more than you hope or expect, how do you know when you reach that? It's going to have to be more than Macedonia, the churches of Macedonia gave. <laughs> so it seems to me like it needs to be more, the faith promise needs to be more than last year's. Because um, last year's could be hoped and expected for. But anyway, so we'll just move on from there. So Titus had begun working with them. He says this, Titus had begun work, already had been, uh, he's already working with Corinth. He's already there preparing them, getting them ready. They know it's going to happen. Paul's coming. He's taking up this offering uh, and this collection that they're going to be taking, uh, trying to raise so that they can help the church in Jerusalem, the poor saints of the church in Jerusalem. They're raising up this money to do this thing. Titus is already uh, involved in that and trying to get Corinth prepared for this thing. He's already working on on that uh, and apparently has been working on it I think for a year uh, 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 for at least a year something like this but now Paul says all right now you're there doing this and uh, now that we know what happened in Macedonia uh, Titus I want you to see this thing through you've begun I want you to see make it happen now I want you to be the leader and make it happen leadership uh, the grace of God and leadership is um, the grace of God is carried and is contagious through leadership Paul's going to use a phrase, he says, I don't want, I, I don't want to do this thing last minute. He's, he doesn't use those terms, but the idea is, I don't want this to be of covetousness. I don't want this to be, you know, me coming and, and you having to give grudgingly or necessity or feeling coerced in any way. I want this to be uh, the grace of God working in your life. And so I don't want to pressure, I don't want it to be something like that. And, and because of that, I don't want to say, boy, you know what, I you know, don't want to walk up to you and say, you know what, I never did this and it's too late to really plan for it. And so would you just come up and give me a testimony. I don't want to do that. I want to have it so that it's planned and prepared and the person, the ones who give testimonies would be, um, be very ready for it and very prepared for it and, and all of those things. But, but the Lord willing, um, we will do that next year for certain. But uh, anyways, the grace of God, the grace and leadership involved. Now we're going to go to number three. I'm going to call it grace abounding. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 7 and 8. He says, therefore, as you bound in everything, and this is it, look at this, as you abound in everything, in faith and utterance and knowledge and in all diligence and in your love to us, see that you abound in this grace also. Remember that grace he's talking about is a gift. He's talking about giving. I speak not by commandment, but by occasion of the forwardness of others and to prove the sincerity of your love. Three thoughts concerning these two verses. Number one, it's not, about, it's not enough to abound in one thing or even many things. Um, the Bible says, G Paul said, admitted that they abounded in faith, utterance, knowledge, diligence, and love. Okay. Paul said they abounded in, in fact, in everything. Wouldn't you have thought that would have been enough? <clears throat> Wouldn't you have thought that if someone in the church, I mean, is an incredible encourager. I mean, he's a caring, 
he or she, a caring kind of person. And when they see someone who is hurting, they are there to help. And they've just got the ability from God, this gift from God, that when someone is hurting and, 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 and down, they just know how to lift them up and, 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 and encourage them and get them back on fire and get them back on their feet. Wouldn't you think that was enough that they wouldn't have to be a great giver to? Wouldn't you have thought that if a person was a great preacher and teacher and he could, uh, you know, that and he could get up and I mean, he can preach the gospel and people get saved and Christians get on fire. And I mean, uh, people grow in the things of God and they understand the doctrines of the word of God. And I mean, they've got it together like that. Wouldn't you think that he wouldn't have to be a giver too? Why does he have to be a great giver if he's a great preacher and get other people to give? Wouldn't you have thought that was good enough? Paul said, no, you're great in everything. I know you are. Be great in this too. I mean, I can go anywhere in the world and I can tell, you, tell people about your faith. And I can go anywhere in the world and I can tell people about your knowledge. And I can go anywhere in the world and I can tell them about your love. I can go anywhere in the world and I can tell them about your utterance. I can go anywhere in the world and tell them about your ministry. I want to be able to go anywhere in the world and tell them what a gracious giving church you are. That's what he's saying in this passage of Scripture. Now, um, we're, I've mentioned this several times, this idea of, you know, no, not supposed to be a pressure, not covetousness or either. So notice what he says here. He says, that's what I want to be able to do, abound in this grace also. But then he backs off and says, this isn't a commandment. Verse 8, I speak not by commandment. This isn't a commandment. No one's forcing you to give. No one, and, and it's the way it is with our faith promise. No one should feel like they are required to give, forced to give, coerced to give. There isn't going to be anything like that involved at all. At least we're going to try our best to make it so that no one feels like, yeah, if I don't, if I'm not a part of faith promise, the church is going to look down at me. I'm not, we don't want it to be like that at all. I'm just talking about the fact that God says, listen, when you are moved to give, that's a sign of God's grace in your life. And we want God's grace in your life. That's what he says. He says it's not about commandment, but then he says it's about sincerity. All right. So uh, verse, uh, I, I speak not by commandment, but by occasion of the forwardness of others and to prove the sincerity of your love. So uh, it's about sincerity. I want, I want, to, I want you to do this um, to prove your, so he's already said you abound in love. Now I want you to prove the sincerity of your love. So if a man did this, if a man said to, to, went to his wife and said, you know, I love you with all of my heart, I do, but um, I'm not willing to sacrifice anything to prove it. Um, I want you to know up front, you're going to have to pull your own weight in this relationship. You'll never get a gift from me and you should not expect one. I will not care for you when you're sick. And if you ever stop being a solid contributor of this arrangement, I will dump you for someone who will be. Would you believe that he loved her? <laughs> no, Paul's told the Corinthians, I want you to abound in love and I want you to prove you abound in love. And you're going to do that through the grace of giving. That's how you're going to prove that uh, there, the sincerity of your love. Now, number four is, the gra uh, is grace and the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, so look at verse 9. He says, for you know the grace, we're looking at all verses, just have the word grace. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, and remember, we're starting, I wanted you to be aware of the, the, the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. And we're working our way through. Now he says, let's just remind you about the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for, our, for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty, might be, may, might be rich. The churches of Macedonia had been an inspiration to Paul, and he had turned that inspiration into action, but the true example wasn't the churches of Macedonia, and it's not Paul, and it's not Titus. The gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, that's called the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ here, and that's the real inspiration of our gift, of what we're going to do for missions. And what we actually, what we give for, to our church, it's the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. His incarnation was an act of grace. That he came to this earth was an act of grace. His sinless life was an act of grace. His death on the cross for you and for me is an act of grace. His victory over sin was an, over our sin was an act of grace. His promise of eternal life for believers is an act of grace. And every time we fulfill our promise in giving... And in my mind, I'm picturing it because what we, what we do is we, we, um, we encourage people to give to, to faith promise weekly. 
And I want you to see it like this, is that every week when you give the faith promise, every week you do that, you are in a small measure imitating the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what's happening. So the last one I'll be done today. Grace and the world. Look at verse 19. And not only that, but uh, who also was chosen of the churches to travel with us with this grace which is ministered by us to the glory of the same Lord and declaration of your ready mind. So what's going to happen is they're going to take up this offering and then there's a group who are traveling with the finances. They're working together as a group for accountability's sake. No one's going to steal it. We've got a group that are doing it together and, that's the, that, and taking it so that, you know, we're collecting this money. You're going to give it up. I want you to know it's going to be held. We're going to treat it honestly and ethically, and we're going to make sure it gets to where it belongs. And, uh, but he says here, he says, there's going to be some who are chosen by the churches to travel with this grace. So here's the point I want to make here today. This grace, the grace this verse speaks of, is it's off, obviously an offering. And Paul says that that, that that grace can travel. It can travel. <laughs> So every time you give to a missionary, and that missionary uses what you've given to get to his field, he's traveled with your grace. 